Well, here we are. It's time for our Wednesday night Bible study again. I'm glad you've joined us for that. Uh, something interesting happened recently. Somebody said, uh, Pastor, when are we going to finish this study of James, the book of James? Uh, they said, uh, I'm tired of getting my toes stepped on. Well, that's pretty good. The book of James, what we're studying, chapter 5, verse 1 through 6 today. And indeed, James is a writer who steps on our toes. And we have really had our toes stepped on, and tonight is no exception. Uh, he jumps on one aspect of Christianity that a lot of times we don't like to deal with. And that is, he deals with wealth and money management. Now it's important that we study that. It was to James. The church has been scattered, as you know. And he says, don't forget that you have a stewardship to Almighty God. Don't get lost in the world and caught up in the desire for gain and wealth. Let's, uh, let's look at uh, what it says, but first let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, once again, we're going to expose our toes that you can step on them if need be. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would minister your truth to our hearts, that you might shape us like Christ and that we might glorify our Savior and how we use our lives, the stewardship of our lives and our resources. So Lord, make alive your word as we study it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in James chapter 5, actually, I believe that the last verse of chapter 4 connects with the first verse of chapter 5. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse 17. It, that verse 17 doesn't match what's above it, but it does match what's below it. It says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So if you know that good is to be done and you don't do it, that's sin. And immediately he talks about the sin of managing your resources. Look at the next verse. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. And I don't believe he's talking to a rich Christian here. I think he's talking to the rich in the world that uh, Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The rich man Lazarus stepped, uh, and Lazarus, the rich man stepped over Lazarus. His riches closed his eyes to God. That's what he's talking about there, I think. The, the rich people of the world have become blinded. Their, their trust is in what they have, not who they know. He says, weep. For the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And the corrosion will be a witness against you. And will eat your flesh like fire. You've heaped up treasure for the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields. Now look at the injustice here. The laborers who the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud. In other words, you cheated people. They cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on earth in pleasure and luxury. You fatted your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just, and he does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And now he's talking to Christians. You see what's going to happen to, to these people that are rich and deny God. Be patient, Christians, he says. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. And I believe we're about to get latter rain upon God's church. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now let's stop right there. And I want to make a statement. And, and I hope that, that you will hear me on this. The Bible does not teach 
that wealth and possessions are wrong. Let me say that again. The Bible does not teach that wealth is wrong and sinful in itself. Having money is not wrong. It's the grip that money has on you that makes it wrong. You see, money has a power in our lives to, to grip us and to turn our heads away from the Lord. And that's why when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, Jesus said to him, sell all and follow me, and he couldn't do it because of the grip that money had on his life. So Jesus said, watch out for that. James says, watch out for that right here and realize that there, there are repercussions for that. Now, somebody said this. Here's a question. Nothing reveals the state of a person's heart more than what? Nothing reveals the state of a person's heart more than what? Two things. Your words, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And the second thing that reveals your heart, your possessions. Believe it or not. Somebody said, if you want to see somebody's priorities, Look at their checkbook. Look how they spend their money. And you'll see what the priorities of their life really are. If we looked at your checkbook today, what are your priorities? Is God even in there in any way? I think that's something we need to consider. Now, in churches today, there's three philosophies I want to talk about in churches today. And I want you to write these down. Three philosophies. You turn on your TV and you're going to hear the prosperity philosophy, prosperity gospel. And you'll hear some people preaching that gain is godliness. In other words, if you'll sow a seed, then God will take that seed and multiply it and give you more. So the more you give, the more God will give you. As if to imply that as you give, that, that God's going to give more and that uh, you can buy God off and you can get what you want by giving God more. Now, the interesting thing is in the prosperity gospel, uh, when they ask you to sow a seed so that you can get more, it's usually sowing a seed into their particular ministry and uh, they reap the harvest from that. And I, I just don't buy the prosperity gospel. Even Paul said in the last days, they'll be preaching gain is godliness. And that's not so. Let's understand something, though. There were some rich people in the Bible. Abraham was very wealthy. He's the father of our faith. Jacob, remember when he came back to Esau and he sent all that wealth to Esau to kind of impress his brother. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man that uh, gave Jesus his tomb so there is wealth in, in the Bible. Solomon had indescribable wealth. And it wasn't wealth that turned his head. It was women that turned his head from God. So there's the prosperity gospel. Second, then there's the poverty gospel. The poverty gospel. Some people say, well, we ought to be poor. Uh, the real true spirituality is in poverty. And poor people are Loved more by God more than anybody else. No, that's not true. People of faith in Jesus Christ are loved by God more than anybody else. Well, he loves us all, but he loved us enough to die for us, didn't he? But the poverty gospel says we ought to give it all away. There was a writer, a popular writer a few years ago, wrote a book that implied that we ought to give everything away. Well, he, he quoted the rich young ruler, sell all and follow me, Jesus said to him. But you'll notice that Jesus did not say that to Zacchaeus. When Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give half I own to the poor, Jesus said, no, no, Zacchaeus, give it all. He didn't say that. He blessed him for what he gave. He gave from his heart. And that's what God wants. Paul said God loves a cheerful giver. But it doesn't mean you have to impoverish yourself to follow God. So I think the poverty perspective is not right as well. Well, what is the third one? I think it's the proper perspective. Biblically speaking, I think 
that God gives us resources so that we can be blessed and we can bless others. I believe that God sees, gives us wealth as a trust. It's a spiritual responsibility. It's a, a stewardship. In the parable of the talents, he gave each one of them differing amounts of talent, which is gold, it's a gold bar. One had one, and one had three, and one had five. Is that they had varying amounts. Well, then he said, came back, the manager came back and said, give an account of your stewardship. What have you done with what I've given you? And I believe that that's what God wants us to ask ourselves. What have we done with what God has given us? James is writing saying these people have not done right by what God has given them. And they're going to be condemned for that. Now, there are four things here that James points out, the four errors of handling wealth. Four mistakes that James points out that these people made in the handling of their wealth. And I want you to notice them. Number one, they gained their wealth through injustice. They gained their wealth through injustice. You haven't paid the people properly that work for you. You have cheated them out of wages. And I find that the Bible recognizes that uh, people should receive a fair wage and God watches. If you're an employer, God watches how you bless your employees. Years ago, many stories came out of the coal fields of West Virginia about the company store. Perhaps you've heard stories of the company store. Uh, a company would buy a mountain and uh, they put their people on that mountain to get the coal out of that mountain and they would give them housing and uh, they had to pay the company back for their housing and they had a company store owned by the company that owned the coal mine and the company store they could go into debt to buy food and what happened to the company store and the housing the company kept those people in debt all the time and they never got out of it they couldn't work hard enough for the company to get out of it So what happens is that uh, they, it was injustice. And I would say this, that if you're hiring people, make sure you're paying them a, a fair wage. But there's another form of injustice as well, and that's the injustice of people who take a check and don't work for it. That's injustice as well. That is being irresponsible gaining your wealth through cheating your employer. I saw an interesting picture the other day on the internet. By the way, my internet just went off right there. You've heard it. I saw an interesting picture that caught my eye the other day. A man was crossing the finish line in a foot race. He uh, was with one of his children. They'd run a race together, probably a 10K or a 5K or a one mile race, who knows. But they were finishing the race together. And he posted the picture of them finishing the race. What got me was, I remember that man. Many years ago when he claimed to have a leg injury that was going to be permanent for life, how he walked around with a cane limping for months until he got disability. Once he got his disability, the cane went away. And then last week I saw him running in a race. And I had to wonder when I saw that picture, is he still receiving disability checks? You see, if you're well and you're defrauding the government, that's unjust gain as well on the other side. And so God is saying here, James is saying, make sure your wealth is gained through hard work, through diligence, and don't expect to get it off the backs of other people. So he talks about the error of false gain. Here's another error, using your wealth selfishly. 
You see, you, you've gotten fat. You've you've heaped it upon yourself. You've gotten gain. He said, uh, just for you. As a Christian, we don't live selfishly. We live benevolent, benevolently. We see wealth as a resource to bless other people. Listen, uh, the rich young rich farmer in uh, Luke chapter twelve. He said, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger, bigger barns and I'm going to be richer. He lived for himself. And it cost him because the Bible says that he, the voice of the Spirit spoke that night and said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of you. Are you being selfish? Are you just trying to uh, use everything you have just for you? Remember, to whom much is given, much is required. Much is expected. Don't be selfish with your resources. Here's the third mistake. They lived for wealth and they lived not for God. They lived for wealth and they did not live for God. You see, money became an idol. Greed was the mark of their lives. They were living to gain not living for God. Who do you live for? An interesting story I want to tell you. I got you got to hear this. Bertha Adams died in 1976 in Palm Beach, Florida. Bertha Adams was known for uh, being a street person, always begging for food, always begging for handouts lived in a rundown shack. When she died, they didn't have anyone, uh, they didn't know her loved ones. So they went to her shack and it was a mess inside. And they began to clean out the place where Bertha lived and they found that she had 7,000 shares of AT&T stock. And they found that Bertha had in that shack six hundred thousand dollars in cash now imagine that she was wealthy and she lived like she had nothing you see it was an idol in her life keeping that money was a was her god and when she died she weighed um, 56 pounds and she died of malnutrition. When she could have lived and eaten and contributed and done so much. There is the sin, I believe, of idolatry. But last of all, James is talking about a proper stewardship of life. And that's what he's saying in those last verses there. But you be patient. You be a good steward of your life. And I had to ask the question, what is a good steward of our resources? What is good stewardship? So I sat down and I wrote four tests of good stewardship. Listen to these four tests. Apply them to your life and see if you're a good steward. Number one is what I call the priority test. The priority test. When you get a check each month or each week, does God get what is first or do you spend everything and give God what is left? Does he get your best or does God get your last? Good question. What if, if I were to look at your checkbook and God does look at it, by the way, what are the priorities of your life based upon your checkbook? Just go through it. Is God a priority at all in your life? In your, in your life? Is it reflected in your wealth? Your wealth should reflect your faith. There's the priority test. By the way, I want to read a scripture there. Listen to this. Matthew 6, verse 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves. This is what Jesus said. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where neither rot, moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Lay up treasures in heaven. I heard one lady that died and went to heaven. All she had was a shack. She said, Jesus, I thought I was supposed to have a mansion. He said, this is all you sent me to work with. <laughs> in other words, she laid up no treasures in heaven that he could work with. Now think about that. What's your priority? Second, there's the loss test. The loss test. If you lost it all, would you still love the Lord? Would you still believe the Lord? Would you still trust the Lord? Remember that song Lee Greenwood sang and it's a, a God bless the USA. Remember how it started? If tomorrow all my things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away. He was proud to be an American where he had the opportunity to earn it again. But there's the question he posed. If I lost it all, and all I had was my children and wife, what would I do? Are you dependent upon your wealth? How much? Is it replacing God in your trust? And so there is the, the loss test, the priority test. Here is the third one. There's the thinking test. How much do you worry about money? How much are you driven by money? Jesus saw a woman in church take her last penny and throw it in the offering plate. And he said, she's given more than anybody. That woman, her last penny went in the offering plate. She was trusting the Lord to take care of her. God wants us to live trusting him. How much time do you spend thinking about money, worrying about money, consumed by money? I read of a man who invested heavily in the stock market. One day an angel came to him and said, I want to grant you one wish. The man said, I want a, a, a newspaper from three years in the future that has the stock page on it. His plan was to look and see which stocks would gain the most in the next three years. And he was going to invest now so that when he got there, he'd have a lot of money. Well, the angel gave him a newspaper three years in the future. And as the man was looking excitedly at the, the stock page, he glanced over at the other page and there was his picture in the obituary column. And he realized all this game means nothing if I have no life. All this game means nothing if I don't have loved ones. All this game means nothing. And so what happens was, is that it changed his life. It made him think properly about money. There's the thinking test. There's the loss test. There's the priority test. But last of all, there's the time test. The time test. How much time do you take away from God by going after wealth and money? How much does it rob you? Does it wear you out during the week going after money so much that you're too tired to go to church and worship God? You need to look at that. Years ago, there was a man, the head of Eckerd's stores. And I don't remember his name. Was it John Eckerd? I can't remember his name. Uh, he was the head of Eckerd's stores. Jack Eckerd. Jack Eckerd heard Chuck Colson speak and gave his life to Christ. Now you've heard of Eckerd drugstores. So Jack Eckerd gave his life to Christ. He was marvelously saved. After being saved, he said, I went into one of my stores and I walked through my store with new eyes. 
He'd been born again. And as he looked at his story as a Christian now, one of the first things he saw was Playboy magazine. He went back to the main office and said, we're canceling Playboy. We're not selling that in my store anymore. And his accountant said, don't do that. It's going to cost you millions and millions of dollars that we make off that magazine. He said, take it out of my store. He then wrote the other drugstores and challenged them to take it out as well. They did not. But he realized that he had a stewardship because he knew Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ changed how he saw life and what was important in his life. And he ordered his life according to his relationship with Christ, not his drive for money. And that's how we should live too. I want you to think of Jesus. Jesus left a throne in glory. Can you imagine the throne that Jesus sits on in heaven? It is the most spectacular, wealthy throne in the world. And he left all that to come to this earth, to be beaten, crucified, down a cross for your sins. But God raised him from the dead. Jesus became poor so that we might become rich. I'm rich because I have Jesus. Do you? If you don't have Jesus, you might have millions of dollars, but if you don't have Jesus, you're poor. Because when you die, the second your heart stops, you go to zero. You have nothing. And when your heart stops, and if it stops without Jesus, you've lost everything. But when my heart stops and I have Jesus, I have everything because I have him. Maybe you need to ask him to be Lord of your resources, but more than that, Lord of your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, sometimes we don't realize how that, how we handle our resources reflects you and reflects what's in our heart. And I pray right now that people will begin to think a little bit about that and how much they're trusting you in their giving, in their earning, and in their benevolence and blessing. And Father, I pray that if somebody doesn't know Jesus, that right now they'd say, Jesus, I've been trusting in wealth and other things, but I'm going to trust in you. I know one day my heart will stop. And if I don't have you, I don't have eternal life. So I'm making you Lord of my life now, believing you died for me on the cross and rose again. And I'm giving you my heart and life. Come in to my heart. Cleanse me, forgive me, and save me. In your name I pray. Amen. Don't forget that this Sunday we're going to have a 10 o'clock parking lot service. It's going to be at 10 o'clock. So please be here, invite your friends, let's fill up that parking lot. See you then.